morning, everyone. Um, for those of you who don't know me, my name's Susan Reddy, and I'm a member of the congregation here. Actually, I've been a member here for almost 30 years now. Time flies. <laughs> Um, and it is my joy to bring a scripture, open scripture up to you this morning. Um, so we, before we begin, would you pray with me? Yeah. Lord, we thank you for your word. It does not come back void, and it does achieve your purposes. But Lord, it needs to be you who speaks it to us, embeds it in our hearts and our minds. It's no good me doing the talking. So Lord, would you take over this morning, Lord, and by your spirit, would you speak? And we say to you, Lord... Speak, your servants are listening. We pray this in your name, Lord Jesus. Amen. Wow, that light is very bright. <laughs> I'm sure I'll get used to it. <clears throat> okay, so one thing you may not know about me is that I actually like to cycle. And about a year ago, I bought a Peloton uh, so I could cycle in the comfort of my own home on days like this where it's too difficult to cycle outdoors. But, and I actually really loved love riding it, but about a month or so ago, I just got really busy, and with ministry and family, and I just kept putting it off. And the thing is, the longer I put it off, the harder it was for me to get back on it. Until finally, I started lying to myself that really, actually, I didn't really need to get on it. And um, every time I saw it, it just made me feel guilty. I started wondering if I could hang laundry all over it so I wouldn't notice it. <laughs> It's like, why did I buy that thing anyways, anyhow? Well, finally, this past week, I got back on it. And the thing that made me go back on it was remembering the coach and the music, remembering how much the coach encouraged me and how energizing the music was. Now, I don't tell you that story as an advertisement for Peloton. I don't have stock in it. Um, I'm telling you it because I just really think it's a good analogy for us. Maybe not a perfect one, but it does picture for us something in our lives. What my Peloton did for me physically, what my coach, sorry, and my, the music in the Peloton, how it filled me up with energy when I got on it. I forgot to tell you that part. When I, when I finally did get on it, sure enough, the coach... Um, says things to me like, come on, you can do it. I'm with you. The music fills your senses, so you suddenly find yourself riding with strength and energy and riding up a hill you didn't think you could get up. And I remembered why I loved riding my Peloton. And so I do tell that analogy as a, as a picture for us of what the Holy Spirit does for us. He empowers us and he strengthens us and he encourages us to do things we simply cannot do on our own. And so this week, we are, um, we're coming into a part of Acts, chapter 5. And you know, all, we, all this month or so, over the past few weeks, we have been looking at the early church. When Before Jesus went back to heaven, he said to his disciples, wait for the Holy Spirit. He said in Acts 1.8, you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you. And that is exactly what happened at Pentecost. This little group of terrified disciples huddling behind locked doors in a, some kind of room, away from the Roman authorities, so frightened, suddenly the Holy Spirit came in, filled them up with such power that they burst from the room and preached so powerfully that that day 3,000 people came to faith on the spot and the church was born. That is the power of the Holy Spirit. And we have been looking at it uh, for weeks now, seeing how this Holy Spirit's outworking in the lives of the early church. He enabled them to do all kinds of things, heal, to persevere with joy despite terrible persecution, to pray powerfully and effectively, and even to love so, uh, each other so much they gave so much of, they were radically generous. All of this, was actually not possible in their own strength. And all of this was such a powerful witness, such a powerful witness to the watching world that people were being saved left, right, and center. And so, when we come to this week's passage, it's a bit of a shock. As I got up, Terry said, good luck. <laughs> it's sad, right? It's disappointing. It's a bit disturbing. So let's look at it together. So <clears throat> apparently Ananias and Sapphira 
um, were so impressed with, and how, with how well received and how well respected Barnabas had been for selling his land and giving all the money to the church that they decided they were going to sell a piece of land and also give the money to the church. But here's the thing. Rather than giving all the money, it says here, with full knowledge, with his wife's full knowledge, he kept back part of the money for himself, but brought the rest and put it at the apostles' feet. So <clears throat> they pretended that they were giving all of it. That's the issue in here. And we can tell that by how Peter responds in verse 3. He says, Ananias, how has Satan so filled your heart that you have lied to the Holy Spirit and kept for yourself some of the money you received for the land? Um, the issue wasn't that they kept back some of the money. Um, you know, we already heard last week from Dan that God wants us to be generous with our possessions. He doesn't want us to hoard our possessions. Um, but um, the problem was that they were pretending they had given all of it. And he says, wasn't the money yours to do with whatever you wanted? It was at your disposal. You could have done anything you wanted. So why did you lie? And you weren't just lying to human beings, but to God. So they lied to gain praise and esteem. They wanted to be so liked by everyone, to impress people. And uh, this was spiritual deception. And God revealed it to Peter because of that, because he would not tolerate it. God would not tolerate in, in his church, and he shows it by striking Ananias down dead on the spot. And so then three hours later, Sapphira comes in, doesn't know what's happened, and Peter asks her, tell me, is this the price you and Ananias got for the land? Now, um, here's the thing. Um, this was not Peter being harsh or tricking her. He was actually giving her an opportunity to tell the truth to repent and to be forgiven. But she doesn't take the opportunity, does she? She doubles down on the lie. She says, yes, that is the price. And so Peter tells her that she has lied, she's tested the spirit, she's sinned against the spirit, basically, and then she is also struck down dead by God on the spot. So <clears throat> this may seem like a very extreme reaction to a lie. I think we're all really glad God doesn't do this to us today, right? <laughs> but I think we have to remember two things. First of all, God is holy. And he wants his church to be holy, honest, transparent. No hidden things or hidden agendas. And this was a vital time at the beginning of the early church. The little baby church had just been born. It was like a little infant. It was very vulnerable. And so God wanted them to know that sin had to be taken seriously. And so basically what, was, what Sapphira and Ananias had done was threatening the church. And so God acted swiftly to protect his baby church. And so what happened when this, what happened then after Ananias and Sapphira are struck down dead? Well, the people are filled with fear. Of course they were. <laughs> but here we have to see it's a holy fear a fresh understanding of the, an appreciation of the holiness of God. I think sometimes we forget how holy God is. He is so holy, altogether other. We sometimes try to drag him down to our own standard. He's so much more. But we also see that there was a powerful out pouring of the Holy Spirit, don't we? That's why I asked for the, the rest of the scripture to be read here, that what we see then is the apostles in verses 12 to 16 go out, perform miracles, heal people. Most importantly, in verse 14, many women, many more men and women believed in the Lord and were added to their number. This is the critical point. People continue to be saved because God purified his church. It did not lose its powerful testimony. It did not lose its holiness and influence and many, many people were saved. Okay, so now let's look at what this means for us. Well, I would say right off the bat, let me just clear your mind. This is not saying that if you don't sell your house tomorrow and give all the money to the church, God's going to strike you down dead. That is not what this is saying. But there are things for us to see in here. So buckle up your seatbelt. Let's go. Okay. First of all, <clears throat> we see in here that Satan lies to us. That is a huge thing for us to pull out of here. 
Satan filled the heart of Ananias and Sapphira and lied to them, somehow convinced them that they could keep some of the money and omit the truth and pretend that they were giving all of it and that no one would ever know. Now, it's not absolutely clear from these verses if Ananias and Sapphira were actually believers. People don't really know. They argue a little bit about it. Here's some things we do know, though. When we are filled with God's Holy Spirit, we cannot be filled with Satan or a demon. Okay? But even as believers, he, we, Satan can still lie to our hearts and our minds, and he can powerfully influence us. And so we have to see that Satan is not a figment of an overactive imagination. He would love it if we thought that, actually. Satan is a real created being. He used to be an angel, the most beautiful angel, the most powerful angel, but because of pride, he rebelled against God, and he took a host of angels with him, and when he fell, he became Satan, and all of the fallen angels became the demons. So Satan is real. He can't be everywhere. He's not all-knowing. He's not all-powerful, but he has a lot of demons working for him, and they are real. And Satan hates God. Because God loves us, he hates us. He hates people. And he works to separate us from God. He is our enemy. He is evil. And John, in his gospel, calls him the father of lies. He says, when he lies, he speaks his native language, for he is a liar and the father of lies. He is the original liar. He told the first lie in the Garden of Eden that led to the first sin and led all of us into sin. He lied to Eve. He came alongside and he twisted God's words. Did God really say that you must not eat from all of the trees in the garden? Of course God didn't say that. But he twisted it a little. Then he directly contradicts God, saying you will certainly not die if you eat from that one tree, which God said they would. And so when Eve believed the lie, She ate from the tree, and she did die, and so did Adam, and so did all of us. Sin came into the world, and that's, frankly, that's why we die. So lying is Satan's primary weapon against people. Let me say that again. Lying is Satan's primary weapon against you. He lies, first of all, to keep people separated from God so they won't come to know Jesus as their Savior. He blinds the minds of unbelievers, we read 2 Corinthians 4, 4, so they cannot see the glory of the Lord Jesus Christ and be saved. And uh, some of his favorite lies to unbelievers are there is no God. If there is a God, he's not a very nice God. He's an unfair God. He's not a reasonable God. And one of his favorites You can earn your way to heaven. So it doesn't matter if there's a God anyways, right? (laughs) And if he can't stop people from being saved, he then works overtime to undermine the life of a believer, every believer, so that our lives are not lives of joyful victory, um, and most importantly, so that we will not be effective witnesses so that other people can also come to know Jesus. So that's his modus operandi. And that is what Satan was doing in this incident with Ananias and Sapphira. He didn't like the fact that this church was being a powerful witness and people were coming to faith. So he infiltrated the church with a lie. So we have to understand any time there is a powerful work of the Holy Spirit, we can be sure there will be pushed back from the evil one. And his favorite thing to do is infiltrate the church with his lies. And his lies are very convincing. He, if he came to us as a devil with a pitchfork, we wouldn't listen to him. He comes as an angel of light and tells us things that sound really good, even reasonable, things we like and want to hear maybe even. He tells us, go ahead and sin, no one's going to know. Go ahead and do that. Go ahead and open that site. Nobody gets hurt. It's going to be a secret. How about telling us, don't declare all that on your income tax? You pay too much tax already, really, you know? (laughs) Um, Go ahead. Go ahead and sleep with her, him, whoever. (laughs) Um, Sex is good. You need to be comfortable. You need to enjoy your life. Or this life, it's not really about God. It's all about you. Get as much as you can before you die. 
or other lies. If you've done that, you've really gone too far this time. God's not going to forgive you for that one. Or you've done it just too many times. Just too many times. How can God forgive you if you keep, keep doing it? Or if this is happening to you, God really must not love you. You know, <clears throat> he knows our particular weaknesses. It's so funny, actually. He actually tried to lie to me yesterday. I recognized it as it was happening, because I'm doing a sermon on it. Um, I had broken my phone, or I thought my phone was broken, and uh, so I needed to go to TELUS. Couldn't receive any calls. As I'm driving to TELUS, I remembered that I'd spilt water on my phone. It's a new phone. It's an expensive phone, and I'm still going to be paying for it, even if I broke it. So I'm thinking, well, maybe if I don't tell them about the water. <laughs> I'm like, oh my gosh. You know, even as I'm talking about not telling a lie, I'm contemplating telling a lie. Satan knows our weaknesses. He knows how to manipulate us. And so we have to be really vigilant. And so how then do we recognize his lies? How can we be vigilant? How can we know what is true? Well, Satan is a liar, but God is truth. And he's given us a book, an entire book actually, full of his truth called the Bible. It's God breathed, given to us by his Holy Spirit, poured into the hearts and minds of men, written down blah, for us, so that we can know the truth. So the Bible is our plumb line for truth, actually. So when we read God's word, it renews our minds and it helps us to think like God thinks. And so no matter what, we can know this is true. And so just like, you know, I don't know if you know this, but when counterfeiters are trying to recognize counterfeit money, they spend their time looking at the real deal so they can recognize when the fake thing comes along. So when we spend our time looking and reading God's word and filling our mind with it, we can recognize the lies of Satan when they come along. And so let me just say this. If anything, if you hear anything that contradicts what is in this book, it is a lie. No matter how many people believe it or how it is twisted to sound reasonable, if it goes against God's word, it is a lie. So that's the first thing. Satan lies to us. Second thing, when we lie, we actually lie to God. <clears throat> that's what it says in the scripture, isn't it? That's what Peter, Paul told is it Peter? Peter. Peter told Ananias and Sapphira, you lied to the Holy Spirit, not just to human beings. The truth is, every sin that we commit is actually ultimately against God. Now here's the thing. As believers, we cannot lose our salvation when we lie. <laughs> or when we do any other sin for that matter, because when we, the moment we put our faith in Jesus Christ, the Holy Spirit, all of him, comes to live inside of us forever. He is a person, the third person of the Trinity, and he will never leave us no matter what. That's what it says actually in many places in scripture, but I've chosen one in Ephesians 1, 13 to 14. You, when you became a believer, you are sealed, you are marked in him guaranteeing your inheritance, okay? So you're not gonna lose him. He is yours forever, praise God. Praise God, really. But what we can do is grieve him. That's from Ephesians 4.30. I don't know if you know this, that when you sin or lie, it grieves, it makes God sad because it hurts us. It actually hurts us in ways we don't even realize. Profoundly damaging. Sin is way more costly than we ever realize. It has repercussions more than we ever know. But it also damages, not ends our relationship with God. He's still God. He still loves us. But it damages our fellowship with him. Just like if I got said something nasty to Doug, it would damage my relationship with him until I said I was sorry. <laughs> Um, and that's not a very good illustration, I know. Doug is not God, but... Um, <laughs> but you get the picture. It damages our relationship with him, right? So we can grieve him. And here's the other thing. We can it, our sin quenches the Holy Spirit. And that's from 1 Thessalonians 5.19. 
so we don't lose his presence. We always have all of him. He's not a substance or a gas. We don't get a bit of the Holy Spirit when we believe. We get all of him. He's a person. But the truth is, he does not always have all of us. We are not always filled with him because we hold back parts of ourselves and are not fully surrendered to him. So, he is less able to fill us, less able to use us. Sin suppresses his power in us because he has less ability to work in and through us and therefore influence the world through us. So that's the second thing we see in here. When we lie, we lie to God and we can grieve him and we can quench him. And I think another really important thing for us to see in here is there is really no such thing as private sin. We might think it's private, Ananias and Sapphira certainly did. No one will ever know about the money, but God knows, and he does expose our sin, for our good, actually. And our sin actually has ripple effects in the lives of others. What we do in private is not so private because the others are watching. Our children, our friends, our family, our church, it impacts. It's like, I think we all know situations, and I'm not going to name any, but we all know of church leaders who've fallen because they have sinned privately, but it has become public, and the result is damage to the church, right? Damage to the reputation of Jesus Christ. People look at the church and they think, well, they're no better than anybody else. Why would I want their savior? And so it's so damaging, so, you know, to be honest, lying, dishonesty, it's a deadly cancer in the life of the church. It eats slowly away at the life of a church so that we are no longer a powerful witness. And that is why God worked so quickly here, because private sin is not private sin. It does impact the church. Okay, so all of this sounds super depressing, right? <clears throat> I'm not sure how I ended up getting the sermon on sin and lying. Well, here's where we turn the corner. The good news is, God is more powerful than Satan and more powerful than sin. Amen. God is more powerful. Greater is he that is in us than he that is in the world. And God is, God's grace is greater than our sin, so much greater than our sin. God does not just love us when we don't sin. He loves us perfectly, always. His love is infinite, vast as the ocean. His grace is extravagant for us. And so he knows how hard it is for us to live, to live free of sin. He knows actually it's impossible for us. He knows we can't pay the price for our own sin, and he knows we cannot resist its siren call in our own strength. And so he sent his son, Jesus, our savior, to die on the cross, to set us free from it, to deal with it, to pay the penalty for it, a terrible price. It cost him his life, the life of God on the cross, poured out for our sins. We sang about it this morning, how great thou art, Lord, that you would die on the cross to make me yours. So he poured out his blood to set us free from it, and when he did that, he changed our hearts when we believe in him, our hearts change. Our hearts come alive. Our hearts begin to love God now and love our sin less. We are a new creation. And not only that, he comes to live inside of us, God himself, God and the very power that raised Jesus from the dead in us. And the spirit and the the Spirit empowers us to do what we could never do on our own, ever, to walk free of sin. The scripture tells us when the Son sets you free, you are free indeed. You know, one of the names of the Holy Spirit is paraclete. Translated, it means comforter, encourager. Like my coach on that peloton encouraging me to ride, the Holy Spirit encourages us. He whispers to us. He says, keep going. Try again. Lean on me. You can do this. Lean on my strength. I know you're weak, 
My strength is made perfect in your weakness. And unlike my coach, he can actually give us power. As I said, the very power of God to enable us to walk free, not perfectly, but increasingly. So, I want us now, as we look at these verses, to look at three takeaways. Don't worry, they're not going to be as fast as the unpacking. I mean, as as long as the unpacking. Um, Three takeaways for us. How do we apply this to our lives? First of all, turn to Christ. Turn to Christ. Knowing Christ and who you are in him is absolutely foundational. You cannot do this on your own. So today, if you do not know Jesus as your personal savior, if you have not asked him into your heart, I urge you, invite you, encourage you, pray for you, that you would invite and turn to him for for forgiveness. No matter what you have done, how often you have done it, take it, all the secret hidden things, give them to Jesus. He died on the cross for them. Tell him you're sorry and you, at that moment, will be set free. And he will come to live inside of you forever. And he'll help you to walk in that freedom. And if you do know him, which I know many of you, most of you, in this room and listening online do know him, if you have been convicted of something this morning, something you've heard, I want to encourage you to recognize that conviction as an invitation. As there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. When you feel that conviction in your heart, it is not condemnation from God. It is God, Abba, Father, reaching out to you and inviting you to turn from your sin and to turn to him for forgiveness and to try again. And you cannot out the grace of God. No matter what Satan says to you, God says to you, I will forgive you. I will forgive you no matter how many times you do it, no matter how many, how what you've done, I will forgive you. Just turn to me. So turn to Christ. Secondly, live like who you are in Christ. Live like it. We are a new, whole new creation, so let's choose to live like it. And you're not alone. God lives in you. He's going to give you all the power you need. But this does not happen passively. It is a choice. It requires effort. Just as I had to choose to get on my Peloton before I could have that energizing word from the coach and the energy of the music, we need to daily choose whose strength am I going to live in. And the way we live for him is by day, by day, dependence on him. And we depend on him specifically, if you want to know specifically how to do that, through prayer and through reading his word. Our prayer lives are actually a barometer of our dependence on God. We battle and have victory on our knees over our sin, and we also learn to love God more than our sin on our knees as we ask him to do that for us. And so are you daily asking him to help you? Sometimes, I have to be honest, it's not just daily, it's hour by hour when sin really raises its head in my life and I'm really trying not to do something I know God doesn't want me to do, but I really want to do it. I wonder if we lack victory simply because we aren't praying. And we also need regular infusions of God's word to help us to know and live the truth, don't we? Because we get bombarded all the time by so much in our culture And there is a lot in our culture that's really, really good, really wonderful. But there's also a lot of half-truths and a lot of lies. And so it's really hard to know the difference. And so I would just say, um, have you heard the expression, you are what you eat? (laughs) What are you eating? Are you mostly consuming a diet of culture, of half-lies, of things you don't know? having a hard time recognizing now what's true and what's real, I invite you to consume God's word every day so that you will know the truth, so that you can know and live the truth. So one day at a time, choose. 
Choose to pray for empowerment. Choose to ask for a deeper love. Choose to read and believe his truth. Fix your eyes on Jesus and in his strength and in his power, put off the old and put on the new. And when sin entangles you, and it's going to, don't live there and don't stay there. Just recognize the Lord's inviting you to be forgiven, to get up and try again. Jesus said, I came to give life, to give life to the full, abundant, flourishing liberty. That's what he came to give us. Not half a life, a life that is filled with sin and half truth and deception and hiding. That's not a life. That's, that's half a life. That's, that's, that's just ashes and ember. Jesus, God wants us to have fullness and flourishing. And so we can have that when we come into the light, when we embrace the light, and when we allow God's spirit to work in and through us, when we surrender to him, then there is fullness of life and joy. And so turn to Christ, live like Christ, and then expect God's power to pour out of you. Expect it. If you live like this, if you surrender to God, you will be so full of the Holy Spirit, people will literally be drawn to your Savior without you even realizing it. Do you know as a believer, everywhere you go, you take the Holy Spirit? Everywhere you go. And so you can be his aroma. The more surrendered you are to him, the more you look it's like Jesus. The more of his aroma is around you and the more people are drawn to him. And you can be his hands and his feet ministering to a lost world who needs to know where to find the security of salvation. And they will see you and they will see Jesus in you and they will want him for themselves. God will use you for his glory if you will surrender to him all of your sin. Granville Chapel, we belong to Jesus. We are his body on earth, the church. As we collectively embrace his power and turn from our sin, embrace his ways, live transparently, honestly, authentically, people will be drawn to him. And this little church on the corner of 47th or whatever on Granville will be a shining light. A shining light. And people will walk in the door. And they will meet Jesus. And we will be like the early church. To God be the glory. Let's pray. Lord, may you be glorified in us. Lord, we, we ask that you would help us. Help us to surrender our sin right now. We say, Lord, we're sorry. Sorry for anything we've done. And Lord, fill us afresh with your spirit. Every nook and cranny, Lord, fill us up so that when people see us, Lord, they see you. And then use us, Lord, for your glory, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen.